Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am Sydney Carlin from Manhattan. I have been on this committee for, I don't know, since about 06, maybe. Um, so, ought six. <laughs> oh, six, ought six. Anyway, it's been a long time, but I, um, you know, see a lot of new faces here, and I am welcome all the new members from both parties that I haven't met yet, and um, it's going to be a, a really interesting year for us to all get acquainted and find out what we care about the most, and I'm always glad to talk with you about anything, so give me a call anytime, and I'll try to talk with you all. All right, very good. Thank you. Uh, also, committee members, you should have received the upper arc, arc boy, I messed up there. Wow. The Upper Arkansas River re Report. <laughs> wow. That's, we do, can we stop the tape and start over again? <laughs> anyway, you have a report from the Upper Arc. There, that's better. Uh, and so it's, it's for your review. That is uh, part of the, legislate, the report to the legislature that they have. We don't act on it, but just review it. Uh, and if you do have questions, let us know. So with that, we will uh, start our informational hear our hearing, briefing. And uh, we appreciate uh, Don Bueller from the Kansas Water Authority here uh, to be here. And I know she's had a full day. You presented to several different ones. And if you're on the Water Committee, uh, uh, just grin and bear it and listen to it again. Uh, but I think it's important that, um, that those of us on the Ag and Natural Resources Committee uh, can gain what we can as well, because water is such an important issue, not only to agriculture, but to this legislative session. So, uh, you should be able to go for uh, maybe half hour, 45 minutes, and so hold your questions at that time. Uh, but uh, either look up here, and uh, Vice Chair Moser, I will uh, put you in the queue to answer questions. So, with that, uh, Ms. Bueller, welcome to the committee. All right, good afternoon. Mr. Chair and committee, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm here to, uh, to present information on the Kansas Water Authority and the Regional Advisory Committees. And uh, I do apologize to those of you on the House Water Committee, you're gonna hear this a second time, but uh, maybe you'll have some questions. Maybe you've come up with some questions since the last time uh, you heard this earlier today. I really represent the volunteer arm of water planning in Kansas. So we are within and a part of the Kansas Water Office, but we really are the volunteer piece with the Kansas Water Authority and the Regional Advisory Committees. And I would like to, uh, before I get into my um, presentation, recognize that most of the people sitting back here, they are the grassroots on the ground folks working on water issues in Kansas, either on a regional advisory committee or with the Kansas Water Authority. So I want to uh, let you know that many of them are here today in the State House. All right, we're ready to go. Thank you. So a little bit of background on the Kansas Water Authority. It was established in 1981. It's statutorily within and a part of the Kansas Water Office. And our job is to provide leadership on water policy issues and programs that address needs all across the state. Part of our responsibility is to advise the governor and the legislature on water policy issues and to approve the state water plan, which we just did in August, comprehensive document about water planning for the entire state. And then we also approve the state water plan expenditures as recommendations. We approve the federal contracts and um, part of the, the water marketing contract. Thank you. And we also prepare and issue the annual report to the governor and the legislature. And I know that you all are paperless, but if you have on your screen the annual report, we'll go through some parts of that here in a little bit. Next slide. So this is a distribution map of the members of the Kansas Water Authority. 
So there are 13 voting members, 11 non-voting members. So there are 24 of us that sit around the table um, to talk about water issues. The 13 voting members um, are on the map here across the state. Um, we are all appointed in some way and I'll show you that here on a screen here in a minute. And then there's also um, 11 ex officios that are not voting members. Next slide. So those 13 voting members, this is the list. Um, I was appointed by Governor Kelly. Uh, Ray, I'm sorry, yep, there you go. Uh, there's uh, an appointment from the President of the Senate, the Speaker of the House, uh, the general uh, GMDs, the uh, groundwater management districts, there's two representatives, conservation districts, large and small municipal water users, two public appointments, the State Association of Kansas Watersheds, Industry and Commerce, and then Conservation and Environment. So the way this works is um, if the Kansas Association of Conservation Districts they'll put forth three names to the governor's office and the governor will make an appointment, uh, except for the Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, and the governor. So um, that's the makeup of the voting members of the Kansas Water Authority. Next slide. This is the uh, ex officio list. And if you're not familiar with this term, so imagine that there's 13 of us, right, that are appointed and we understand water in some fashion. Most of us work in water in some way, but we need some experts around the table to help us to make decisions and to uh, make recommendations. So these ex officios are all uh, either the secretary or um, other folks that work for different agencies. And uh, all of these folks sit around the table and they, give us lots of information. They'll help us to make decisions, help us to understand statutes, help us to understand programs, but they are a very important part of the Kansas Water Authority. Next slide. So this is the committee structure of the Water Authority. It's pretty simple. Um, we like to keep it simple. We have a budget committee. Um, the budget committee, of course, works on developing the budget, but the way that this process works, I think is really important to understand. It starts with the regional advisory committees. So remember, um, I told you there were regional advisory committees that are part of this process. They're the grassroots folks. They make recommendations, and then it comes to the budget committee and the budget committee um, works with all of the agencies to come up with that budget recommendation. So there's, it's a pretty comprehensive process. There are a lot of people involved, a lot of um, information uh, brought to the water authority to make this decision about the budget. The public water supply committee, to be honest, before I was appointed to the Water Authority, I don't think I truly understood the role of our reservoirs and public water supply and this water marketing program. So our uh, public water supply committee has a really important role. They set the water marketing program rates and they make program policy considerations Members are employed, membership is appointed by the KWA chair. But I think one of the things that's really important is, um, for example, we're having a water authority meeting tomorrow here in Topeka at the library at 9.30 a.m. if you'd like to come and attend. But one of the things we'll look at is a couple of water marketing contracts. And these are cities or counties or rural water districts that need the water out of our federal reservoirs. So for example, I live south of Eudora. I belong to Douglas County Rural Water District number four. They own storage in Clinton Reservoir. They have to have a water marketing contract that has to be put together with the Public Water Supply Committee and approved by the Water Authority for me to get water sent to my house seven miles south of Eudora. So I didn't quite understand that whole process until uh, I learned 
about it, but it's in a really important part of our water supply system to make sure that our communities have the water that they need, um, not just um, in our communities and, and making sure that folks have water delivered to their homes. There's the RAC Operations Committee. RAC is an acronym we throw around. I apologize. It's Regional Advisory Committee, but um, we have a slide here to talk about those folks here in a minute. But that RAC Operations Committee job is to hear messages from the Regional Advisory Committee, elevate those to the Water Authority, and to approve new membership. Next slide. So the Regional Advisory Committees were established in 2014 by the Water Authority. And this is a really important part of the process. There are six, I think, Water Authority members that used to be on Regional Advisory Committees, including myself. I was on a Regional Advisory Committee for about four or five years before I was appointed to the Chair of the Water Authority. And I'll be honest with you, that was some of the best work I've done. When I look back on all the work that I've done, I'm really proud of the work that I've done on the Regional Advisory Committee because it's really a grassroots effort. You can make change and um, really elevate things that need attention in the water world. Um, but there's also things that you can do amongst your committee to make things better in your communities. One of the things that I like to tell our Regional Advisory Committee members is that when you go home, you're probably, more than likely, the person in your community that knows the most about water. And so you need to share that information and, and let people in your community know about what the issues are. Go to the coffee shop, sit and have coffee with everyone. Go uh, grab pizza somewhere, but be sure and share the message around your community because you really are the folks that know the most about what's going on. So the role of the Regional Advisory Committees is a really important part of the process. And Representative Blex still serves on a Regional Advisory Committee. Thank you. Next slide. These are the Regional Advisory Committee areas. So if you look at everything that's on the eastern side of the state, they're really the boundaries are watersheds. I was on the Kansas Regional, Regional Advisory Committee. Representative Blex is on the vertigris, which is being hidden by the, uh, the little deal there, the TV sign. Um, the, the regional advisory committees that are on the western side of the state, those really are more aligned with groundwater management districts. But these are the folks um, that are working on these, uh, these issues in these areas, and some of these some of these regional uh, planning areas are pretty big. If you think about it, I was just talking to one of the folks from the um, Smoky Hill Saline. That's a big area when you think about how long it is, right? Probably down, what, I-70? Um, so these are some big areas for them to deal with, but we have folks scattered throughout those areas that bring the local water issues to the surface. Next slide. Regional Advisory Committee membership, they are volunteer positions, they're four-year terms. The chairs are appointed by the Water Authority Chair. Membership is approved by the Water Authority. And we have some core membership categories. So folks will represent agriculture, at-large public, conservation and environment, industry and commerce, or public water supply. There are other region-specific categories that they can add if they choose to, and you'll see those there. Um, there's lots of different opportunities to add more um, advisory committee members that represent different entities. Next slide. So this is the state water planning process that we go through. The issues are identified by the public, the regional advisory committees, the agencies, and other partners. Then the Kansas Water Office works on the draft development of the Kansas Water Plan. There is a public input and hearing process. And this last time around, we uh, went through this process and uh, the Water Office staff received a lot of public comment and very thoughtful and uh, very good public comment. So those were taken into consideration um, when the final Kansas Water Plan was completed. 
That document was approved, as I said, in August of this year. We just approved it. I do want to take a moment and say this is a huge effort. Uh, the water office staff, when they were working on the water plan, they still had to do their regular job. So it was a heavy lift for them to add this to the work that they were already doing. But they got it done, and it's a great document. Um, I believe a copy of it is in the library here at the State House. If you'd like to see a paper copy, it also is online on the Kansas Water Office website where you can uh, look at that entire document. And then the next piece is that we advise the governor, the legislature, and other decision makers on the priorities of the Kansas Water Plan. So that's the state planning process. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna go over a little bit of our annual report. So maybe you can pull it up online. Um, I'm going to refer to a few pages that I think are important for you to know about. Um, so this is the annual report to the governor and the legislature from the Kansas Water Authority. But the water office, Kansas Water Office, puts this document together. And the purpose of it is to report back on how the state water plan dollars were spent, what programs they were used for, and uh, any policy recommendations that the water authority uh, comes up with. So, um, okay, next slide. Thank you. So before we dive into the details, I think it's really important to say a hearty, hearty thank you. Thank you for the full restoration of the $8 million into the state water plan last year. Thank you for the $80 million that was used to pay off water supply storage at Hillsdale Lake, Clinton Lake, and Big Hill Lake, and also the early debt retirement of the John Redmond bond. Next slide. All right, so we're gonna go through first, um, right inside the front cover of the annual report is a list of the water authority members. So if you wanna go back and look at that list and and contact anyone, you can do that. And also there's a list of the ex officios. So we're gonna go to um, recommendations for state policy. So this would be on page three, if you're interested in following along. So uh, one of the statutory requirements of the Kansas Water Authority is to advise the governor and the legislature on water policy issues. We are a volunteer advisory board and so we uh, started a process, which we'll talk about later, um, to come up with these water policy recommendations. So number one on the list is the critical depletion of the Ogallala Aquifer. Uh, we'll go through, so back in August, we, had a, we hosted a water policy conversation. And that's really what it was, it was a conversation. But the reason that we did it was when House Bill 2686 was um, in the legislature last session, um, after that was over, we really felt like the conversation couldn't stop. So the bill didn't pass, right? Um, but we needed to continue the conversation to talk about these things. It does not do us any good to wait until January to start talking about it again. And so it was important for us to talk about this in the off season, if you will. So we decided we would host a water policy conversation simply to see what people thought about what the priorities should be. We invited stakeholders and the water authority and we had a um, water policy conversation in Salina and we, it was um, moderated by Susan Metzger with K-State and our goal was to see what rises to the top among the topics. And there were two, the Ogallala Aquifer and funding. Those were the two things that people wanted to talk about and that people wanted to do something about. So when, after that, we had our uh, next water authority meeting. We approved the state water plan. We had a very good discussion about the Ogallala Aquifer. Every single member of the Kansas Water Authority 
went around the room and said that they wanted to sustain the Ogallala Aquifer. That was an important moment. Every single member, there was not one person that said that they did not want to do that. So we created an Ogallala committee that met in late November. That committee came up with this statement for the critical depletion of the aquifer, and it was presented to the full water authority and approved in December as a recommendation to the governor and the legislature. The next section here is state appropriation for leveraging, leveraging matching funds. We just wanted to make sure that uh, we bring to your attention that there are lots of federal dollars out there that we need match for. Uh, there are many programs. You can read through this section. Uh, I won't read it to you, but um, we, need, we wanted to elevate that we need matching dollars in order to leverage matching funds. And then the next page, page four, talks about the funding deficiency. So we've always talked about this statutory $8 million into the state water plan. It's written in statute, and then also we get fees. So the total is around $20 million, give or take. Um, and that number, though, is not enough to fully fund the state water plan. So if you go look at the state water plan document that we just completed, just approved, and we were to fully implement it, it would cost $69 million per year. This is documented on page four. Uh, the agencies that um, use the state water plan dollars to implement the state water plan, they went through and added up what they thought it would take if we were to fully implement it. So on page four, you'll find that $69 million. Also in here is our budget recommendations. I won't go through that, but um, if you'd like to see that, that's in here as well. Um, I think you can go to the next slide. Okay, keep going, because I talked right through it. This was uh, just a, a visual of how we got to the point of the policy recommendations. You can go to the next slide. And the next one, I talked all the way through it. Whoop. All right, so I'm gonna go through just a couple more things inside of the annual report. So the Water Office broke down this report into different initiatives. And so on page nine, it's the beginning of the Ogallala Aquifer Initiatives. So if you're interested in knowing what types of programs do we currently have in place that could help us with the Ogallala Aquifer, these are the programs. And so you'll be able to see how much funding there is, kind of what, what the program's about. For example, water conservation areas, a lot of talk about those right now. Those are a really good way to do some conservation. And then if you turn to page 12, this is the reservoir water supply and sediment management. And if you live on the eastern part of the state, you might be asking yourself, well, why isn't she talking about the reservoirs? Because those are really critical too. And the reason is because thanks to you and the Corps of Engineers, we have a pilot project that we hope will begin in 2024. It's a water injection uh, project, Tuttle Creek Reservoir, to see whether or not we can use that technique to deal with the sediment that's filling into Tuttle Creek Reservoir. So that pilot project needs to play itself out so we can see whether or not that'll be applicable to other reservoirs as well, and hopefully it's successful. If you turn to page 17, these are water quality initiatives. So you're gonna see all kinds of projects that are used to deal with water quality and how much money is being spent on each one. Um, it's really broken down very nicely. And then the last section is on page 24. These are statewide water issues, such as Rattlesnake Creek, uh, Republican River update, um, Hayes, R9, Ranch, Water Transfer, et cetera. So you'll find more information there. And then the very last page is drought monitoring. And we often don't talk about this. I mean, we've been in a drought, but the Kansas Water Office is responsible for monitoring the drought and putting out the drought monitoring and, and notifying, I believe, the governor. Yes. So uh, this is a really uh, comprehensive uh, 
educational document if you want to dive in and learn more about the programs and how much money is being spent and where it's going. This is what you need right here. And about where we think that future needs need to be with the 69 million. So the last thing that I want to mention as I wrap up here is that in Governor Kelly's budget um, that just came out, she has recommended full statutory funding of the 8 million in the state water plan. She also included 53 million for debt retirement that would eliminate two remaining reservoir debts related to Milford and Perry reservoirs. This payment would save the state 29.4 million in interest payments, and this payment would pay off the entire remaining reservoir debt for the state of Kansas. This also locks in state control of the water. We currently do not have state control of the water. Until we pay for it, then we will have state control. Uh, I'd like to wrap up by mentioning that the Water Authority and Regional Advisory Committees have been here all day. I hope that you've had a chance to visit with one or two of them. If you haven't, feel free to catch, I mean, I think most of the folks here are with us, so feel free to maybe catch them and, and visit with them about uh, their issues with water in the state. And I'd like to thank you for recognizing the importance of water and demonstrating a commitment to water funding. The state water plan funds programs across the state to meet the goals of the state. So thank you to the committee. I appreciate your time and I will stand for questions. Thank you, Ms. Bueller. Questions? Representative Hsu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for, for the presentation. Um, uh, I know that, that you said that the full funding of the water plan will cost about $69 million this year. My understanding of, of water issues tends to be that, that the longer that we wait to address something, the more expensive it becomes over time. So um, I guess just do you have any indication on, you know, if we wait, you know, how much more expensive does, do you expect it to get if we don't fully fund it? Well, that's definitely a consideration, right? With uh, inflation, I think this year it was like, this last year was like 9% or something. So um, there's a lot to be considered in that. And I'll look at Director Owen. No? Okay. Yeah, it's going to continue to cost more uh, the longer we wait. I mean, we've already waited a long time, but hopefully we can find a way uh, to move forward on these projects. Uh, I think water is incredibly important. And I think you all agree. Yeah. Other questions? Committee members, if you want, you want to come sit in your seats, that's fine. If you want, we'll take a quick. <laughs> they heard, they heard this presentation this morning, so they we're, did. Gonna them, we're gonna cut them a little slack here. So well, and they asked a lot of really good questions this morning. I had to get Director Owen up here. They asked so many. So <laughs> yes, uh, Representative Younger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So what do you mean by state control of the, the reservoirs? Yeah, sure, absolutely. May I have Director Owen? Thank you. Yes. Just state your name for the record, please. Thank you. Yes, I'm Connie Owen, the director of the Kansas Water Office. And the way the um, water marketing program works is the federal government built the reservoirs, they own the reservoirs, the state of Kansas has a contract with the federal government through the Corps of Engineers and my office, we're the state entity on those contracts for storage in those reservoirs. Then in turn, we contract with municipalities, industries for water out of those reservoirs, out of that storage contract. So there is a revenue stream from those customers and we in turn then need to pay the federal government. So it's called when, let me start over. The contracts that the water office has with the federal government are set. So there were estimates made ahead of time as to how much storage space the state wanted to contract for. And that included projections for need into the future. So for example, as of the beginning of last year, before the funding decisions, we had contracts with all these different reservoirs. Some of them included storage space 
for which we didn't have customers yet. So we didn't yet have a revenue stream to service that debt, but we will still have to pay the federal government. The $80 million last year, thank you all very much, that was infused into paying off reservoir debt for those three reservoirs, put us in a position where the remaining 53 million that we have to pay can be serviced by existing customers. So we have a re the ongoing revenue stream. The question is if we pay those off now as opposed to paying over time, we will save the state $29 million. The question that you get to about state control, the federal government can manipulate the water in those reservoirs as they see fit except for the water we've paid, the, con the storage we've paid for. So for example, um, the storage that we'd paid for, they cannot dip into that, so to speak, to make releases or make decisions to withhold it. That is within our control if we have paid for it. So if we finalize the contracts we still have remaining and pay the whole amount now, then we will have control over that storage amount now. The amount that the $53 million would cover, yes, we have a contract for that, and yes, we can pay for that over time, but we don't have control over that water until it is paid for, if that helps answer your question. I'm sorry if I went way over what you had asked. Where's Ed Roth? Yes, I, uh, I found out in our Energy Utility Commission meeting, I believe you were um, presenting there, mm -hmm. that we own the water, and, but the federal government is, is charging us for storage space for our water, and then we're having to pay for it, and I'm not getting any money back from my water that's being stored in, in, in those reservoirs. And so uh, a lot of us on the committee just couldn't wrap our heads around that, you know. You've explained it well here today. And, uh, but it's, I just find it odd, you know, we should just take, it's our water, it's Kansas land, and uh, we should be in control of it. And now we're paying to get in control of it. And so we still owe, what, 53 million? Yes, sir. Yeah, so if we pay that off, then we have control of that water. Yes, and, and if I may, um, the reservoirs were built by the federal government. The federal government owns them. Without those reservoirs, the water would have passed on out of the state. So we do have a statute in the Water Appropriation Act that says all the water of the state of Kansas is dedicated to the use of the people of the state. The water that's in those reservoirs would not still be there, but for the federal reservoir. So maybe that helps resolve the idea that we're paying for our water. I don't know if that helps. Representative Carlin. Thank you. <clears throat> Connie, you always explain things so well, and, and I really, I mean, I've had that explanation a couple of times in various sources, but that was really, really good. Uh, but I have a, it brings a question to my mind. Um, so when we say the federal government, are you, ref I mean, just, well, I've been here a lot of years, and I just said that, so I should know, but you're talking about the Corps of Engineers. So the Corps controls the water because we have the debt. The Corps controls the water because the Corps built the reservoirs. All right, all right. So there's both, both issues. One, the storage is because we have the debt. The cost of the storage is because we haven't paid for it. Right. The, the debt is our contract that we have to pay the federal government for, for storage in their reservoir. I don't want to confuse people by asking too much because you did such a good job, but I do want to ask this question. During the flood of 93, uh, Manhattan, uh, Tuttle Creek, um, because the Corps needed to do their thing, mm -hmm. uh, flooded a lot of homes in our community. 
-hmm. by releasing water into our community, you know, so, so that they, I don't know, they were protecting water downstream or flooding downstream or something. And, and our community actually, you know, suffered from that. I'm sure they made it up to us money-wise, but um, that won't change. The control of the, if they need to make a water release during a flood or something, uh, they still would have the authority to do that. I'm, I, that's what I'm trying to ask, I think. We, our contracts for storage are not for the entire capacity of the reservoir. So the federal government will remain in control of the rest of the water that's in the reservoirs. And we do work collaboratively with the core does have the final say, so to speak, with the reservoir management. But they work very closely with the water office. I have one person in particular who knows every single detail in and out about all of this. And he is at times on call 24 seven, whether it's drought or flood, that there are active operations that there is constant monitoring of levels and needs upstream and downstream. So there's ongoing communication between the Corps of Engineers and my office to try to make the best decisions based on conditions and forecasts and whatnot. But ultimately, the Corps does have control over the entire basin, the, the whole, all of the Missouri, there's the master manual that controls all of that. So they do have the final say over everything but the amount that we have locked up under contract. So it would be fair to say that our storage amount, our capacity that we're buying, we would always be able to have. Correct. As long as it was well, in the, in the As lake. long as there's water there. As long as there's water there. It doesn't guarantee that there will right. be water. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I didn't want to, to leave this room not understanding that okay. because when you say this, this morning, the budget director talked about uh, you know, ha would give us full control of the, I mean, it would give the governor control or the state of Kansas control of the water. And I'm right. going, there's got to be, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure, Representative Blex. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can you answer the question, or if I recall correctly, the balloon payments on the water storage was uh, due in 2033, 34. Did we get any super break on uh, reduction by paying that off early other than just reduction in interest? In other words, I'm thinking out loud, it would have been nice to have the federal delegation involved with that and saying, hey, when I go into the bank and pay off a loan early, I usually get a little break. Was there anything involved that or we just my understanding is that we avoided the interest payments over time. That only. The federal government did not reduce our contract obligation. Thank you for that clarification. Representative White. I think this might have been answered already, but I understood the lake, the water in the lake is owned by people who's contracted, say, Tuttle Creek in, in the city of Manhattan, and it's silting in. It's getting less and less water. So who's holding the bag? Who doesn't get as much water? Is it the federal government owns less water every time? That is a very good question. And your annual report does refer to that. What you're getting at is, I believe, the, the issue of sedimentation of the reservoirs. So over time, reservoirs will fill in with sediment. It's what they naturally do. Rivers carry sediment. When they're stopped behind a dam, sediment drops, and that starts filling in. And over time, it will fill in with sediment. So that is our major issue with water supply in eastern Kansas. And we have the water injection dredging pilot project on Tuttle Creek Lake that we hope in partnership with the Corps of Engineers will help address that very issue. The, I'm sorry, I'm getting lost as to what your question was to begin with. I think you've answered, I mean, 
who gets the water and who oh. gets the mud. Okay. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's that's pretty darn clear. Thank you. And whose problem is? I think you were you asked who's left holding the bag. Right. Okay. So, um, the Corps of Engineers and the Water Office have had extensive discussions on just that question, because initially, my understanding, this is I'm getting a little bit far afield of of my. Um, historical knowledge, but my understanding is when the federal government built these reservoirs, they knew they, were, they had a finite lifespan. And so there have been times that the Corps did not look at this like we have any obligation to go beyond that lifespan. We built it, it's going to last 50 years, and sorry. But that's changing. And in fact, the water injection dredging pilot project concept that is designed to help extend the life of the reservoirs was an idea the Corps shared with us. And so we have a very engaged, active partnership with the Corps now to try to deal with sedimentation and extend the life and the usability of the reservoirs. So the Corps has skin in the game now too. If I may. Continue. What is the cost of this water injection, and is the core liable for some of that cost, or is it all the state of Kansas? We are sharing equally. Good. So, and yes. Thank you to the legislature over a period of years. Water was, appro water was appropriated. Money was appropriated for the water injection dredging process, and as of this past year, there was enough that we reached um, our halfway mark that we could share with the Corps. And so they were able to get funding from the federal government that they needed. So we've put it together and now we have our joint, it's basically 50-50. And we're working together to plan and design and study and do the engineering for exactly how that process is going to be put into place because all kinds of different considerations have to be studied and, and resolved. So we're actually half and half partners going forward. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Minix. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for my tardiness. I was speaking to 34 county representatives that live out west over the Ogallala Aquifer. One of the best questions I heard this morning in the Water Committee I'd like to reiterate is not my question, but I think it's brilliant. I'd, I'd like to ask each of the individuals of the team at the microphone if they believe there's any need for further statutory um, rules or regs to to help accomplish what the Kansas Water Authority statement said in December in their resolution? <laughs> sure. Uh, that's a great question. And this morning, I think my answer was that I don't know that I'm exactly qualified to tell you what those tools might be. But um, I think that what's really important uh, about the statement from the Water Authority is that we wanted a couple of things. First of all, we really wanted this to get some attention, right? We wanted to elevate this as a topic that needs more attention. That's why we made the recommendation to you all. The second piece of that is that it's really important that the local people who live in these areas help determine the path. If you look at the recommendation that we wrote, it says a formal collaborative process. It also says the collaborative process should engage state agencies, regional advisory committees, local stakeholders, groundwater management districts, and the Kansas Water Authority. That's basically everyone. There, everyone should be engaged. I mean, this is an aspirational goal, right? It's like looking way out into the future and saying, if we could go there, that's where we want to go. That's what this statement's about. But you have to break it down into little pieces, and you have to work with the local communities 
and you have to work with the groundwater management districts and the regional advisory committees and the folks that live in these communities. The folks that know what it means to have a water quality issue, the folks that know what it means to know that your water is running out. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. Sir, I don't, I don't have the answers. Um, I'm here representing the regional advisory committees and the water authority. And the water authority has not made any sort of collective statement or decision beyond this one. So I can't speak for that body, um, but I would be interested in hearing, like, for example, what our agencies think. I mean, those folks are the experts. They're the ones that are trying to implement all of these programs. We should be asking them what tools are we missing in the toolbox to try and solve some of these problems. So I'm not sure I really answered your question, but I think it's complicated. But I also think that with um, a group effort to try and solve these problems and to reach across and help our neighbors, I mean, that's what I would want if it was me in that situation. I would just want someone to try and help me solve the problems. So that's my answer. Would you like to hear from Director Owen? Sure. <laughs> that sounded a little tentative. Um, it's hard to top that, right? It's, it's very hard to, to expand on, on what Don has said, but I would reiterate that um, my view, I am not on the Water Authority. I do not have a vote on the Water Authority. And so I can speak from observation about what was intended, and Don has articulated that, I think, perfectly well. I would point out that, as she said, this is a goal. This is a point in time when so many people are scared and so many people's futures hang in the balance, and we really need to do something to address these problems. And they're looking, I believe, they're looking for help. Who's going to be able to help them? And I think we need to take this, these statements, these policy recommendations from the Water Authority as that's the direction we want to go. That's where we want to end up. We want to end up with a sustainable, economically successful, thriving situation in Western Kansas. And as the Water Authority has recommended, that will take a collaborative process. And it will take, as they say, data-driven goals and metrics and, and stakeholder input. It's too soon, I believe, to say exactly what those steps are going to be. Each of these state agencies, as Don said, the, the experts, they implement and administer a laundry list of statutes and volumes and volumes of regulations. So that kind of conversation needs to come in as what could these tools be. I suspect that there are regulatory things that can be done. I suspect there are statutory changes that can be made. But that's what this process, I believe, is meant to help tease out and help to clarify. So I think in general, Representative Minix, are there things that could be done? I think so. But it's, we're not there yet to identifying exactly what those would be. So that's, I hope that's helpful. I know it's not specific, but. I appreciate your answers. And I think it's uh, an issue that we need to continue to work toward finding solutions. And, and I appreciate Don mentioning that a lot of these solutions are local. It, it varies so much, and, and we need local input to move forward and improve a lot of the things in different areas of Kansas. And I appreciate your answers. Thank you. Representative Probst. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this, this might, Connie, you might be better to answer this, but the conversation about storage capacity and dredging reminded me of, if I'm remembering right, some testimony from several years ago regarding the state the, the stream stable stream, stream bank stabilization program um which i if i remember 
before it, it's it's kind of a paradox because I think we underfund that program and I think we have difficulty getting landowners to agree to some of the the requirements of that but then we end up spending a lot more money on the back end and dredging. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that program and maybe some of the challenges that exist within that? I can talk a little bit about that. If I, um, to, if you really wanna get into the weeds, so to speak, I would like to call on Andy Lyon with the Division of Conservation with the Department of Agriculture. Will that be Fine. acceptable to you, sir? Thank you. Sure. Yes, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, our stream bank stabilization program uh, is funded by the state water plan. Um, Representative Prost, as you stated, it is a bit of a paradox. Um, we do utilize that funding each year, and we do some really good projects. Again, we see, especially on the outside bend, of those, uh, those rivers, especially above Tuttle Creek Reservoir, above Perry Reservoir, and above John Redmond is where the program's focused, where we have really bad sedimentation issues in those reservoirs. Um, but we see uh, cut stream banks where the, the trees no longer anchor those stream banks in. Um, and so the goal there is to buy time, essentially to reestablish that riparian forest uh, to anchor down that stream bank. We do that by shaping the bank, by putting some rock out into the river to try to deflect the flow back out into the center of the river. And again, we plant those trees there so that that can grow back. Um, a very important program, like you said, for the sedimentation aspects. Again, we do all kinds of upland conservation to try to keep that sediment on the land. Um, we do know a lot comes from those stream banks as well. Um, so we try to do that. The dredging, I think, is important for the sediment that's already there. But I think it's a point uh, well made that we need to do the best we can on the landscape and on the stream banks uh, to keep that sediment where it is before it ever it gets to our reservoirs. Mr. Seibert. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I also apologize for being late. I had a number of people in my office talking about water. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. No, it's, it's something we need to talk about. I live down on Sheeney Lake, grew up in the bottom of it, and Reno County and Sedgwick County, and we have GMDs and Department of Water. I'd like you to help me answer a question to my constituents. They ask me all the time, uh, and it depends on which side of the road you're on, whether you're in a GMD or if you're in the water district. Because on one side of the road, there's permits and the irrigation system is almost mile after mile after mile after mile square. On the other side of the road, there is none. And, uh, you know, we heard today we need to make sure we have money or more money to fund this and protect it. But they're asking me all the time, and they're saying, you know, since 1945, we implemented rules and irrigation and regulations on overuse or whatever, six or seven layers of government in it. How did we get to this point with all this government involved in it? Why are we having this conversation? Because are they, who's not doing their job? The farmers or the government? Well, that's a really tough question. I know it is. I get asked to me all the time. And I, I don't know Wichita enough about the, farmers. the GMDs to answer that. And I'm looking to see if there's anyone in the room that... Is Earl here? Is Earl here? No? No. Back. Mark, Mark I back. don't mean to put you on the spot because this is the question, you know, why are we having this problem and why is it different on this side of the road or not? So maybe you can help me later at another time okay. to answer this to my constituents because, you know, we appropriated money. You know, we've talked about it in the 80s. In 2012, we had to try to do a lot of things. We tried to put setbacks and rules on certain types of irrigation, but yet some irrigations or the GMDs would put it on ground that should have never been irrigated. And the good farmers that took their conservation and took their end guns off, they voluntary, and you can see in the places that did this, they made significant results. And yet some of them are declining. Is it enforcement? Is it not penalties and fines? Because you know, one of the farmers today told me, he said, you know, if I got a semi and I haul a thousand bushels of corn on it, I'm legal. If I haul 1,300 bushels of corn on it, I get a ticket. After two or three tickets, I lose my driver's license. I asked the other day how many permits have been suspended, 
they had no answer. So has there never been a permit suspended for misuse? I don't know. But these are the questions I need to answer to my constituents with your help. And I know you got a tough job. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to be well, on it. But I don't live and breathe this stuff like that. And we had a great conversation in my office before here about working together because, again, the dry land farmers, the conservation farmers are doing everything they can. They were talking about, you know, drop nozzles, drag nozzles, burying. But the end gun ones, they will refuse to take it off. And it's like if I want to buy, I'm a farmer, been farming for 50 years. If I want to upgrade my planter to make more money, I have to pay for that. I have the physical responsibility to make it work. But now they're saying that some of these guys in their areas, they want their money for that. And they want that money to change that system from, what do you call them? You know, uh, I can't think of the name for that. Yeah, nozzle packages, but you know, they don't help the conservation farmer buy a better piece of farm equipment. Why? This is their responsibility. They're getting an economic benefit with the free use of that water. And yet they still want more, the bad ones. I mean, I'd like to visit with you more because I got a lot of answers and a lot of people in my town halls ask me these questions, Mr. Chairman, and we've been talking water since the 80s and, and I just can't answer it. And again, the people of Wichita, deserve the water too. They don't feel they should have to pay for it sure. because the water is owned by the people of the state of Kansas and it's equally shared. So that's my question. I, I probably went off on too big a rant, but maybe we could talk no. later. Ab absolutely. Okay. I would just say though that, you know, I, I'm not the expert on this, but I think Director Owen could maybe address a little bit of it, so. And in your response, I've been trying to find the expert and I can't find him. <laughs> At this point, I'm offered to discuss this with you at length, um, but I would like to say that you've just drafted the perfect final exam question for Water Law 101. So, <laughs> so I'm happy to talk to you later. There was a lot going on with your question, but. I appreciate that. And that's why I say, uh, I'm just a short timer here since 2008, but we've been discussing this <laughs> since 2008. <laughs> and again, I, you're right, we need to answer those. And those guys that was in my office said the same thing. There's rules, just like, I think the perfect example is a truck. You overload that truck, you're gonna get a penalty. You break the law two or three times, you're gonna get your license suspended, you know. Do we need to, again, that's the conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you for your question. Yes, go ahead, Do you, have, you have an answer? Just thank you for your question. Okay. Representative Schlingensiepen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your presentation. I have one question. It's probably more of a technical question, again, for the gentleman who was just up. I'm sorry I didn't catch your name. Uh, you Andrew talked Lyon. about upland riverbank stabilization. Is this, uh, you know, water injection dredging that you're talking about, is, is this a pilot project in the sense that it hasn't been done before and there's no experience with it? Uh, or, and, and that's number one. And number two, does that, does that pilot project include the downstream effects at what rate sedimentation is then spewed out to the downland uh, uh, watershed and the effects that that has? Good questions, both of them. And I, it is a pilot project in the reservoir setting. It is proven technology in waterways, harbors around the world. But it hasn't been used in a reservoir setting before, which is one reason the Corps of Engineers is, is very excited to work with us and try it. Because if it is successful, it would have applicability, not just all across Kansas possibly, but around the world. Um, your second part of your question? Uh, the second part of the question uh, is, you know, is part of this pilot project. So we, we take this silt, oh, we, 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 we put it back in solution again, and then we right. send it uh, out through the dam. And now we've got creeks, r rivers, creeks, and all kinds of things that flow out from there. They're now subject to sedimentation. At what rate, how do you determine, right. you know, what the proper rate is that they can handle that would be normal if the reservoir weren't there? Right. And so, how long will it take to desedimentize, I guess is what I'm saying, well, uh, the I, reservoir? Well, the answers to, the, ex the specific answers to those questions are being studied right now. So as I said, the, the Water Office and the Corps of Engineers are, are intensively involved in the planning process for this pilot project, and as well as acquiring the equipment and all that. Part of what they are trying to study and anticipate and forecast 
is the level at which sediment, uh, increased sediment flow will not create problems for downstream um, public water intakes and for habitat and other, and other impacts. So that is part of the plan to try to avoid creating more problems downstream. Representative Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I, I have a question about the uh, fully funding of the water plan. Um, and you'll have to forgive me, I'm a, truly a citizen legislator and I'm just trying to get my head around all of these things. But there's been a request from the governor and there's been talk about fully funding that and it's been mentioned here and the, the, the dollar value. Could you give me just a rough idea about um, how much of that would be a one-time capital expense and how much of that would be ongoing expense year after year? And um, uh, what would be the, con uh, the, the benefits of paying that all, you know, fully funding that this year? And what would be the consequences if we did not? Thank you for your question. So I'm going to refer you to page six, well, five and six of the annual report. Um, on page five, we talk about the statutory uh, d transfer. The water plan gets six million from the state general front fund and two million from the EDIF fund, the Economic Development Incentives Fund. And that eight million comes in, and then there's also fees that are included. So on page five, it shows receipts. So these fees are municipal water fees, clean drinking water fee fund, industrial water fees, stock water fees, pesticide, fertilizer, pollution, and sand royalties. All of those also come into the state water plan fund. So when you add all of that up together, it usually is around 20 to $22 million that comes into the state water plan fund currently, currently. But that doesn't fully fund the state water plan. So if we go back to the recommendations page on page four, we have listed out here what it would cost if we were to fully fund the state water plan. And it's about 69 million a year. That does not include any capital projects, correct, right? Yeah, these are just the programs. And so this would be an ongoing dollar amount to fully fund the state water plan annually. Um, the 53 million that we talked about that was in the governor's budget to pay off the reservoir debt, that would be a one time right there. But the 69 million will continue or would continue for the state water plan. And so um, that's never happened before uh, that we fully funded the state water plan. But if we were to do that, then we would implement not only these projects and programs that you see here in the annual report, but you know there are possibly some other things that would need to be developed. Because when you go through the state water plan document, you'll see that there's a lot that we haven't even touched yet. And it's broken down into the different categories, um, just like the annual report is, and all of those things need to be funded. And so that's what the 69 million would be for. But currently it's about 20 to 22. Okay, thank, Does that thank answer you. your question? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Okay. Well, you're not done. Oh. I, I, haven't asked you, I haven't asked you mine yet, so. <laughs> Uh, in the interest of time, I'll only ask you about 40 questions in, in 20. No, we'll be, we'll be quick. Um, thanks again. Thanks for being here. Uh, so if we would pay this off as the governor would, the, 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 our, our bonds, what would the extra $29 million go to? Did you guys talk about that in your meeting? We have not because this was the recommendation in the governor's budget and the water authority has not met since that came out. We will meet tomorrow here in Topeka. So we have not discussed it as a board. So before you leave town, you'll come and report back to the committee. No, I'm just kidding. Well, we could, we could think about that. Um, well, and that's fine. And I would, to go back to some of your comments a few minutes ago about uh, your recommendation to get some attention, I, I would, I would tend to think that you did get some attention from folks 
<clears throat> that live uh, west of um, 81 Highway, I would say, definitely. And uh, uh, so that being said, going back, um, do you think that the dredging of John Redmond, we made that investment a few years ago, was that a good investment from, 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 from the water authority standpoint mm -hmm. as you look at planning? I wasn't a part of that when that was completed, so I don't feel like I have enough right. knowledge, but would you like to speak to that at all? I also was not a part of that decision when that was made. Um, so you're telling me I'm old. <laughs> I'm telling you we're new. Right. Um, so what the Water Authority would have thought about that, they act as a board and... I I understand. I understand, and I'm, now, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to get somewhere, so that's fine. If you both don't, and again, that just shows my age. How long I've been around here? Then when we did that, so th that that's fine. Maybe what I can say is, the dredging of John Redmond was conventional dredging. Dredge out the sediment, put it somewhere else. Temporary fix. It's going to fill in. It's going to silt in again. The, ex the cost of that is way beyond what we could possibly pay for for our other reservoirs and our other sedimentation. The water injection dredging pilot project, if it works, is a fraction of that cost. So that's why conventional dredging is not something we're looking at doing good. right now. Very, very good. The representative probes. On the topic of John Redmond, though, I, I do want to point out because I was involved um, can't remember exactly when it was, but there was a significant flood event and that came shortly after we dredged John Redmond that basically filled in a lot of the capacity that we had dredged out, which I don't want to keep hammering this drum, but if we're really seriously talking about these water issues, we have to talk about prevention. Dredging is not a cost-effective solution compared to stabilizing the silting on the front end because one big flood event will undo all the work we did, and that's what happened in John Redmond. Okay. Very good. All right. Uh, Ms. Bueller, and I guess I will, a couple of things, just kind of from my understanding, maybe the committees as well. The Water Authority is volunteers, as you have said, appointed by the governor or other leadership. Who determines who's the chair of the water authority is that a, is that's that a yearly governor. basis of governor? Mm -hmm. So the governor, can, if you were brand new to the water authority, didn't know anything other than served on Iraq for a year, you could be the chairman of the Kansas Water Authority. Is that correct? Well, I don't, I don't know. Um, I mean, I had to go through an application process. I had to fill out an application. I had to show that I had some credentials. But I want to yeah. take the person. I mean, the personality out of it, but my. That, I guess that's, I just, as we look at the structure, because last year we spent, you know, it got, the last, last year's water bill got brought up, and that was one that was held by one individual, and so, I mean, let's just be honest. Um, there was not a lot of partners in to try to get that thing done, so to say it was a failure, I think, is, 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 doesn't do it justice, because it didn't get the vetting it should, so. One, but one of the things we talked about was, and, and one of the representatives today talked about all the different layers of how to get something done. So I guess my point to you as a volunteer on one of these, uh, you know, deals we deal with with water, do we have too many? Do we have too many levels? Is, is, the, water, is the Kansas Water Authority still a viable tool or a viable unit, or are there other things, you know, do, do you believe that, you know, and, and being on it now, being the chair, you have seen things. I mean, as we look at truly making this commitment to water, will we get bogged down because we have to have, get approval from nine or 10 different things, even for this, for this type of thing, because ultimately it's those of us that are on this table and to sit up on the floor up there that will make the determination of where we go with water. I'm going to answer your question and say, yes, I think the Water Authority is still a valuable part of the planning process. And so are the regional advisory committees. You want to know why? Because we're the grassroots. We're the people that are on the ground. I'm wearing heels today, but I always am in tennis shoes or cowboy boots or work boots. We're out there doing the work. Everyone who's in here today, 
their boots on the ground. They're the people that are living with these issues every single day. And so we bring a perspective that is needed to do water planning across the state. I think if you take out the um, volunteer component, you lose a huge value in bringing those those local issues to the water planning process. I think it's critical. I, that's my personal opinion. Very good. Thank you. Other questions? Seeing none, thanks again for being here. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Were we easier than water? Was water committee a little harder for you? Or was this... <laughs> I, can I just say it was equal? Okay, okay. that's fine. <laughs> Well, thank you, and thank you for the other participants that were able to uh, to to speak today and answer our questions. So, uh, uh, hopefully, you, you met committee members, you found that uh, informative, and uh, again, of what's going on, and that's only one of uh, probably, hopefully, several. We'll also be able to uh, do our best to keep you updated on what's going on with water. So, our next meeting is scheduled for. The 25th, which I believe is Tuesday. No, it's tomorrow, isn't it? It is tomorrow. Well, today's Tuesday, isn't it? Our plan tomorrow is to have a discussion on the joint resolution with the uh, Lesser Prairie Chicken. The Senate did pass it out uh, yesterday, I believe. And so probably what we'll have is just a, a discussion amongst ourselves. Uh, I don't know if there's any real experts, but it's something that uh, the federal government um, has decided to put it on the endangered species list, um, but the administration has decided to wait now till April 27th to fully to implement it now, and so giving us some time, but uh, we can have a discussion uh, and, and talk about um, the impact it could have on Kansas, the Kansas economy, and the resolution says we support the federal delegation, which is basically saying Kansas knows what works best for Kansas. And so we will discuss that more tomorrow. So that is the plan. Anything else for the good of the committee? Uh, Representative Minix. Just a quick announcement. Uh, the Water Committee has arranged, and I'm sorry I didn't uh, make it before Mike Armstrong left. Water One will host us for a tour. If you're really concerned about what dredging will send down the Kansas River, Water One operation, which provides municipal water in, in Kansas City in, in the Overland Park, Johnson County area, uh, hosted this last year. I had somewhat the same question, and it, it, the answer is amazing. But if you really want to go, if you're really truly interested in that, I, I believe we can let some of you uh, piggyback along with our group to go tour Water One. It's on a Friday. I, do you remember the date? 17th of February, I believe. Cindy Howerton, my vice chair, has been setting that up. Uh, it's it's amazing tour. We'd ask you to to drive your own vehicles down and 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 have a three or four hour tour. It's very interesting to see that side of it if you're from an area somewhat different than that. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Saying no other announcements, uh, we will see you tomorrow afternoon for our next meeting. We are adjourned.